Well, I have the joy of introducing our next speaker, Rose Bates. I think we have a heroine among us. <laughs> what we're about to uh, see and witness um, with what Rose has put together for us today, um, it took an extraordinary amount of effort, courage, persistence, and sensitivity to pull together these images. And um, I have a feeling there's going to be a little book or some kind of autobiography that's going to come out of Rose in some near future um, describing the process of what it took to bring these images to us today. Many of these are going to be images you've never seen before. And they come out of this deep esoteric history that we are all so privileged to be studying and embodying and living. So um, I just want to um, give a lot of gratitude to Rose for what she's um, put together for us. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. And um, big welcome to all you out there on the live stream. We know that um, you're watching and we appreciate your presence. It's always such a pleasure to be here at these annual gatherings. And I'm so grateful to everyone that makes it all possible because it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, this is a third ray, <clears throat> third ray theme conference. And one of the attributes of the third ray is change and mutability. So this presentation will be a little bit different than originally planned. I have long had a deep interest in esoteric history. I feel there is an extensive history of the Theosophical movement and many of its key participants. And over the years, I've wondered about the history of Alice Bailey and the work that she started and how things progressed and morphed and changed over the decades to the present time. <laughs> what, it, what was it like back in New York in the 1940s at headquarters? Who were some of the people involved in this massive work? What was their experience? What was Alice like? What about her three daughters? Were they involved in their mom's work? This yearning to connect the dots, to have continuity of the past with the present, led me to inquiry, and those who may have some knowledge of events of that time. And to one such person that Alice Bailey mentions in her autobiography, her grandson, the son of her middle daughter, Mildred. In her autobiography, Alice says, one year, my second daughter, Mildred, came back to the United States and there married Meredith Pugh, which was a most unfortunate marriage, though the indications were that it should not be an unhappy one. Circumstances arose which were so drastic that within four months, Mildred was engaged, married, and divorced, and her little son was on the way. <laughs> this same little son, was more than adequate compensation for all she went through. Well, that little son is now 82 years old, and his name is Gordon Murdith Pugh. I have met him, and I've gotten to know him extensively over several months. And he was able to share a rich oral history with me. Our intention was to share that oral history with all of you. In the format of an interview, if he could not physically attend this conference, However, just before our scheduled interview date, a series of events occurred which have landed him in the hospital and have halted those plans. However, he wishes for me to go ahead as best to share the history of his mother, Mildred, who everyone affectionately called Billy, and his grandmother, Alice A. Bailey. He wishes to be able to contribute anything that will further their work and legacy. He wanted me to share with you some never before seen in this era photos that his mom and Alice kept. They tell a deep and rich story. I will attempt this morning to share part of that story in only 35 or so minutes. <laughs> so this year marks the 100 year anniversary of the commencement of the work of the Tibetan with Alice. So Alice describes this eventful day in her autobiography. It was in November of 1919 that I made my first contact with the Tibetan. I sat down and began thinking, and then suddenly I sat startled and attentive. I heard what I thought was a clear note of music 
which sounded from the sky, through the hill, and in me. Then I heard a voice which said, There are some books which it is desired should be written for the public. You can write them. Will you do so? Without a moment's notice, I said, Certainly not. I'm not a darn psychic, and I don't want to be drawn in anything like that. I was startled to hear myself speaking out loud. The voice went on to say that wise people did not make snap judgments. <laughs> that I had a particular gift for the higher telepathy. And that I was being asked to do, that what I was being asked to do embodied no aspect of the lower psychism. Alice and the Tibetan went on to work together for 30 years until her death in 19, December of 1949. So this is a picture, portrait of Alice, that hung in her New York City apartment. It hung in her living room, along with more photos that you will see. It is of her as a young lady. Gordon did not know her exact age at this time, but we both assumed it was in her early 20s, just out of finishing school. Here's another image you'll see she had in her home. It's a painting of little Gordon when he was eight years old. And his mom. It was done in 1944 by the famed artist Seymour M. Stone in his New York City studio. He was a Russian immigrant and he lived from 1877 to 1957. And here is Gordon back in February of this year. <laughs> Sorry. This is also recent, so it's still a little. A little touchy. He is posing with great pride of his mother and his heritage. He was born in Kent, England at 2.25 p.m. for you astrologers out there on June the 5th, 1936. And here he is as a six-month-old baby with Alice in December of 36. This was a family portrait. Um, it's actually a postcard that was probably about 1937, also in England. As a child, he lived with his mother, Foster and Alice, in England, staying behind with his mother when they would split their time between New York and the America. Foster and Alice would go back and forth between America and England, so, but he would stay with his mother. But as the war was escalating between England and Germany, he immigrated to the United States, traveling on one of the last passenger evacuation ships called the Roosevelt. Oh, here it is. Sent to bring Americans back to England. He arrived in, oops, he arrived in June 1940, and then he went to New York. So as we can read from this newspaper clipping, so this newspaper was from uh, the Miami Herald in December of 1940. Uh, being in Miami, this is a quote from his mom, Mildred. Being in Miami, where it is so beautiful and peaceful, makes it difficult even for me to believe there was a war any place, says Mrs. Mildred Pugh. Here from England with her four-year-old son, Gordon. There the quest of Miss, there the guest of Miss Ellsworth Hope, and that gives her address, 38. 92 Douglas Road, Coconut Grove. I came over in June on the, president, on the President Roosevelt, and they spent the summer at Spring Lake, New Jersey. So some photos of Gordon at that time. I know we passed one back here. And there he is about, probably about three years old, or two and a half. And uh, this is about what he looked like when he came over on the ship. In New York City, he went to public school 187. His middle school was Riverdale, River, Riverdale Country School for Boys, and he graduated from McBurney High School at age 17. And after graduation in 1953, he went to Colorado with his mother to study at the Colorado School of Mines, graduating with two degrees in mining engineering. He went on to work and live in Colorado 
Montana, Utah, Oregon, and Nevada. From the time that he came to America, he lived in New York City with his mother, Alice and Foster, in their apartment until Alice's death in 1949, when he was 13 years old. Now, despite being so long ago, he had razor-sharp memories of that time, the people and the work. He recalled childhood memories of non-school days when he would accompany his mother to the 31st floor of Lucy's headquarters on 42nd Street and help her open and sort through the men of goodwill mail. He remembers lots and lots of mail <laughs> and also helping Alice sort through mail on her bed back at home. He remembers the games Alice taught him while she was in bed at home or at the hospital and the tea gatherings she held at her apartment that was by word of mouth invitation to open-minded influential people of the day to discuss current events and what could be done about them. He remembers letters Alice would write to Eleanor Roosevelt and to Billy Graham discussing the future of humanity and the part that the United States play, must play. He says Alice was invited to the Rose Garden but by Eleanor. I do not know if she went. He recalls the good friendships of Marvin Lipman, who worked at the Arcane School, and John McLaughlin, head of the Triangles work. John would wrestle with him on the lawn and take him to weekend after and take him on weekend afternoons to the public swimming pool. He loved family outings when they would all go out together and join with family friends, Roy and Marion Walter, to Jones Beach on Long Island. He remembers the Arcane School conferences and how he would help Alice with the placement of the table seating of who was going to sit where during the dinners. And the not so pleasant memories of the ill health of his mother and of Alice and her endless days spent at Roosevelt Hospital. Many more people, many more stories, many more memories. But now let's take a journey back in time around 100 years ago to the late 19s or early 1920s when Alice was just starting her work with the Tibetan. Some of these photos are very old and have faded. Some can probably be restored to better quality in the future. So these slides are of Alice's girls at the Theosophical Society of Cortona in Hollywood, California. We know she started her work with the Tibetan around 1919 while she was at Cortona. And this is, um, this is either Ellie or Mildred. The previous one was probably Dorothy. And the, the inscription on the back of this one says Mildred. And this is a good friend of Alice at the same location there. So these are the earliest pictures of the three little girls. We have Dorothy, Ellie, Ellison, and um, I believe uh, Billy, his mom, is the middle one. This is about 1921, 22. And they love the water. There's lots of photos of them at the beach, in the water. On the back of this photo, it says Craigie. This picture may be in California before the family moved to New Jersey. <coughs> because Craigie is mentioned in the autobiography and the girls being left in the care of Craigie. But at the same time, the timeline of the history needs to be clarified as to if this was after she moved um, from California to the east. There's too many girls in here to be all Alice's. <laughs> but we see Foster Bailey in the, up in the front. Then we're going to go back. This image here is the two girls, Foster and Alice, not being very photogenic with her head down. <laughs> but uh, it looks like at a time right 
as they were moving from California or they had just moved to California and they're probably either in New Jersey at this time when they were at Ridgefield. That's a little better, Alice. <laughs> And here's the three girls a little older. And Alice with two of the girls. On the part of the inscription on the back of this photo says, here am I, oh where and why, cruelly attacked by the furious camera tigress. <laughs> so here we have Foster Bailey, very early photos, probably around 1922. Looks like he's doing some yard work here. It's probably Ridgefield, New Jersey. And the part of the inscription on the back of this says, he is armed and looks determined. <laughs> I think he had a car. And here's Foster with the family dog. Gordon told me the name of the dog, but I've since, I'd have to go back to my notes to remember. I'm not exactly sure the location of this one. Also, Gordon told me an interesting story why Foster Bailey has white hair. He said that he got white hair very young, that he was in the Air Force, and that he had crashed his plane, and he was in intensive care for a long time, but that when he emerged out of that and recuperated, his hair was snow white. It remained so. This photo, I debated whether to include it or not due to its poor quality, but it shows a little bit of clues perhaps to where this is with the house in the background and the streets at the time. And Alice just looks so happy. <laughs> so now we're gonna go to Alice's apartment at Castle Village. We're going to skip through her work in England and Ascona and we're going to jump right to the early 1940s. This is actually a little pamphlet. That's what it looked like. It was completed in 1939. Gordon said that they lived on the 11th floor of building 140 at Castle Village. The living room overlooked the Hudson River and the George Washington Bridge before it was a double-decker. Here's a little brochure of, it was a new, new complex completed in the fall of 1939. And as we know, Gordon came over to the United States in June of 1940. So I'm assuming they moved in right around that time, right when this was finished. Here's part of the view of the George Washington Bridge from her apartment living room. So now let's explore the inside of this apartment on and around Christmas Day, 1940. 48, I'm sorry. So in this photo we have Marvin Lipman and Billy, Gordon's mom. And we notice the painting of Gordon and his mom above the sofa that we saw earlier. And Marvin Lipman worked in the Arcane School. It was a good family friend. And here we have Foster, oh, Marvin, and Billy. And 
And in the description on the back of this photo says Foster's evening pastime with Gordon. He's playing like cowboys and Indians. And we notice there's an image in this photo behind Foster. And we notice the image on the wall of the Last Supper. And we see all of Alice's books. And we see the little portrait, I have the pointer here, right here that we saw earlier of Alice holding the baby. And this image here, we'll talk about a little later. So here we have Billy shooting back. <laughs> He's about 12 and a half here. And again, oops, 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 oops. Where am I? Here we are. And again, we have this image here. The inscription on the back of this one says, Gordon shooting indicates that we like ale. It was Christmas. Gordon told me that the central theme of his living room was always the Christ and the Buddha. In this image, we can see that Christ image a little better. And the back of this says, Catherine Stiles, my very dear nurse. She lived in the apartment with Alice for a number of times, a number of years, during out the last part of Alice's life. And um, Alice put her directly in the fourth degree of the arcane school. Gordon remembered her name after probably about 50 years. He said he'd never mentioned that name. So here's just an image of another corner part of the living room. We see a lot, oops, God, I need the pointer here. We see these photographs here on her bookcase. You can almost read some of the titles of the books. The inscription on the back of this says, another corner of our big living room. It is in this living room that Gordon tells the story that when he was about eight or nine years old, at 3 a.m. one morning, he awoke and he saw a light on. He wandered from his bed to the living room where he saw Alice seated in her ch large chair, probably this chair here. He said, Grandma, Grandma, what are you doing? She was taking dictation from the Tibetan, and his mother made sure he never interrupted her again. <laughs> He said she used to write on a type of plywood board that she would put across the armrest of the chair. This image was a frequent theme in Alice's home and in her work at headquarters. They used to send out Christmas greeting cards with this with this image, with the second stanza of the Great Invocation. Gordon told me a story about this image. He said that Alice said that the eyes would follow her around the room. I was going to look up the uh, author of who painted it, but uh, This is the front of a Christmas card that that image would be inside. You can still see the outline of the envelope right here. It imprinted itself. And that would be the inside of the Christmas card. If you would like copies of these, they will be available in the bookstore later. 
let's continue our tour of Alice's living room. It's now Christmas Day, 1948. So here we have Billy, Gordon, and Foster carving a turkey. It looks like they got a pretty good helping there of mashed potatoes and what as ounce is that? Apparently Alice wasn't able to join at this table because this is one year before she passed away. So her health was not very good. He, Gordon shared with me that in the last few years she was pretty much in bed either at home or at the hospital. The next three photos I'm about to share show Alice in bed and she doesn't look that good. And I asked Gordon if I could share these and he said yes, that he thought they should be shared. So just letting you know. So he was about 12 and a half. And Alice would work in bed with this uh, type of bed tray or, or something. And this is December of 48. The next photo is a little later probably sometime in 49. This shows her dedication to the work, despite her illness and all the difficulties, she was determined, determined to finish her work. Alice would take down dictation in a type of shorthand that only she could decipher. It was no, as no such secretary could transcribe it, she would have to rewrite out the dictation. And all the books were written at least three times. Once in shorthand, once again transcribed, and then once again for printing. Alice had said that the Tibetan had long wanted to give her a translation of the Bhagavad Gita, like he had given of the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali that Kathy just spoke about. This was one of the things she wished to accomplish before she passed on, but I don't think it did. So here we have the corner. So here we have Billy, Foster, and Fred Braun, who golden, who golden toward me worked in the mailing and shipping department of headquarters. So who's taking this picture? Maybe Gordon. We notice on the wall the bookcase. We notice this oval portrait of Alice that we saw earlier. We see a framed family uh, relative in uniform right here. And we see a Christmas tree. And we see something hanging on the wall behind the Christmas tree. So let's see if we can see things a little clearer here. Oh, and we have Foster and Billy. So in this image, Foster is now missing. So maybe he's taking the photograph. And we see Alice, and we see a portrait hanging behind the Christmas tree on the wall, half obscured. Now here, we see Foster. He's a little out of focus because the camera is actually focusing more on the wall and the portrait on the wall. According to Gordon, this is the Tibetan. 
the one that Alice was in telepathic communication with. He does not know where it came from or how she got it. This next photograph is a zoomed in version. It's a little blurry, but you can maybe get a little bit of a sense. Symbolically hidden by a pine tree with a five pointed star on top of it. This is our zoomed in image from the original. <coughs> and here is one, the next one is done by a photo lab that uh, helped with the negative of this image. This is scanned in a higher resolution, but it does add a little more information that can kind of crowd the image, perhaps. Yes, it looks like he has a mustache. And there's a coat collar on the side. Gordon also shared that he believes he has this image. As a portrait. So now let's go on to headquarters. Let's go to where Alice had her offices. Lewis's publishing company was on 11 West 42nd Street on the 31st and 32nd floor of the Solomon Tower. I'm not sure you can see those floors in this image. They were sequentially getting smaller and smaller as the building went up. So I tried to count these floors. I think I only counted 28. But um, she operated on those, those two. The Arcane School was on the 32nd, and uh, Mildred's work, Men of Goodwill, was on the 31st. A sign on this tower says, Solomon Tower, offices for rent. I visited this building a few years ago. And at the front entrance, as you pass into the building, there's an arch that has all the zodiacal signs on it. This, Gordon told me, was in the meditation room. And here you have the Master Moria, Kudhumi, and Rakazgi. And there's an image at the top that's a little faded and hard to see, but it looks like an image of a Christ like figure giving some sort of blessing. And we have a table, a Buddhist cloth behind it, two candles. And uh, there's something right here behind this. I'll have a better photo of this later. And there's a little story behind it. So. You also see the Buddhist, um, some of the image of the Buddhist statues. There's one right here. You see the chairs where people would line up in front and sit for the meditation.
So this image here is more of the table. There's also some sort of, a, right here, some sort of lotus type. This image here looks like a hand sketched drawing of perhaps a master of some sort. Not exactly sure which one. There is a hand sketch drawing I'll show you later that could even be this image. A little later, there's another image of the same room, but it's several years later. Exactly when it is, I'm not sure, but you'll see some of the differences. Here you see there's only two masters, and they're different. This is a different drawing of, or sketch of Kudhumi and Moria. They're on different sides. Rakowski is missing, and it's very much different. You have different here. But you do have the same image here. What that actually is, it's a leaf from the bow tree that Alice was given from, from someone that went to India who says that, um, well, well, we'll see in the next slide here. Here's an image of that leaf. The inscription said that this leaf came from the bow tree and under which Buddha sat and received his enlightenment. She had this on her altar or that meditation room. This is a sketching. I asked Gordon if he knew who this was. He said it wasn't Moria, it wasn't Kuthumi. He thought it was Christ or Jesus. And he wasn't sure who drew it. But most likely we would assume his mom, Billy, who did painting and was sort of an artist, or he possibly even Alice. Here's another image of the Sacred Heart of Christ. It could be what was on the, above the three masters, but it was found with, um, with some of the, um, the other images that she had. And it was painted by Charles Brosram, probably around 1910. You can see here, there's sort of like a cross with a rose at the, at the center. Let's return back to Gordon, Gordon and Mildred. These next two images are in color, and they're quite I originally thought this was a much later photo because it's in color. However, Gordon can't be more than maybe 14 here. He had a long life love of horses. <coughs> to this day, he keeps three horses. And his mom, Billy, was an avid lover of horses. And here we have Gordon and his mom right here. This is probably the mid or late 1960s. And I believe she passed away 1968 or 69. So still fairly young. She had lung cancer due to being a smoker, which he said Alice did not approve of. <laughs> But what are you going to do? So as we're coming to the end of our slideshow here, if there's anyone out there 
that has more historical information that could be added to this narrative, time frames, events of It's rumored there are recordings of Alice. I have yet had that confirmed or know if there are. But if there are, it would be very interesting to have, to see some of that. So if anyone, and we know Alice wrote tens of thousands of letters. Some must still be out there somewhere. If anyone has those or knows a people that do, I feel that they are important and they should be compiled to greater clarify the narrative of this magnificent woman and her work and to contact me if anyone has additional information. So in the workshop we'll do a brief overview of Alice's 30 years work with the Tibetan and we'll continue our photographic journey as we will visit Ascona, Switzerland where Alice held conferences at the home of Olga Orb. don't know quite how to pronounce her German name. And uh, much lecturing was done there. And a group formed which included the Grand Duke Alexander of Russia, Violet Tweedale, and Roberto Assangeli. So as we come to a close, may we take a few moments of meditation to express our gratitude to Gordon Meredith Pugh. As we come to a close, may we take a few moments of meditation to express our gratitude to Gordon Murdoch Pugh and his mother, Mildred Kathleen Alice Pugh, for their contribution to the work, their role in preserving history for all of us, and may we hold Gordon in the light and love of his soul and the unwavering strength of the group soul for the highest expression and unfoldment of his purpose as he faces this most difficult chapter of his life. Thank you.